Hello. A uh, very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, first of all, welcome to Fosdem. Seeing lot of geeks around here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, topic for uh, like my session <coughs> is persona. Like how many of you actually know or about or heard about persona? Can I have some hands? Okay. So. Yeah, uh, persona is uh, generally uh, it's login system. It's uh, similar to uh, single sign-on, but uh, let's see how it is different and why you have to opt for this, and uh, how we can uh, on which protocol it's working, and we'll see its specs and all. <coughs> so how a uh, Mozilla uh, persona like uh, is useful for users? How we, how we, how it is easy uh, to implement this for developers and how uh, the port protocol uh, works on this. So uh, Mozilla Persona, as I said, uh, it's better way to sign in or a login uh, system like single sign on. So uh, this basically uh, helps users to log in quickly, a sec on secure manner, and uh, it doesn't ask you a password. So it's something uh, which is uh, different from single sign-on. So uh, when you uh, do single sign-on, we need to uh, actually uh, depend on uh, third parties, like in order to uh, authenticate the credentials, right? And uh, it asks to uh, share your uh, privacy information, like uh, maybe your uh, phone number. Uh, uh, like let's consider an example when whenever we log in uh, through Facebook via Facebook. Or to any other site, it asks uh, you to share uh, information to access the information of your email and uh, phone number, or uh, so that uh, we get a lot of uh, mails and uh, they can post on your wall uh, without asking your permission. And it also has many privacy issues. So, like uh, I'll just show you like what's the current state of our uh, sign. So. Uh, this is how when we see a website, it asks uh, you to log in via uh, Google or Facebook or Yahoo. So when you say uh, these kind of errors we come across uh, when even we use when uh, try to uh, log in via Facebook and all. So and uh, this is the main concern, main concern of everyone uh, that everyone's information is being shared on uh, social. So which in turns uh, have like lot of. So the better way to sign in is uh, use uh, Mozilla Persona, uh, which actually helps you to sign in very easily. Just create an account, uh, and next it asks you uh, it asks you to enter your email ID. So uh, the Persona mainly uh, takes email addresses as a unique values and then proceeds for the login. So uh, you can uh, it. So uh, this is like a screenshot of uh, how you. Uh, manage uh, email IDs in the uh, browser. So, and uh, the supported browsers are like almost every version of Firefox supports it, and remaining all. And uh, as you know, everyone know that uh, Firefox, uh, Mozilla, uh, Mozilla Firefox has introduced the uh, Firefox OS, and in that we natively supports uh, this persona uh, sing sign on. So why we have to focus specially on uh, developers and why it is easy for them to implement uh, this kind of uh, sign-in system. Uh, so as I said, uh, it's uh, very easy to implement. There are like about four steps. Uh, you just include the uh, the JavaScript uh, file of that, and then uh, put login buttons, and then verify it, and that's it. So uh, I say it's a federal protocol because uh, it doesn't actually ask you uh, to log in uh, via. It's like a database only with unique values of email IDs. It doesn't want any other information. So whenever you just uh, give your email ID as a login, uh, it actually validates of if it if you give your email ID as at the rate yahoo.com. So it in turns ask you for the first time to log into Yahoo, and then. It actually uh, checks whether the email ID is existing and whether it is uh, correct or not, and then uh, it turns back to your site and then it's login. And as I said, uh, 
it uh, it helps not to share your personal and privacy information into other websites and uh, you don't need to store passwords and uh, you don't need to rely on third parties so again uh, this in turn el eliminates the registration form so whenever you visit a new website it's uh, horrible to register every site and keeping uh, in memory that uh, each every website uh, every login and password it's very difficult and sometimes they ask for username sometimes they ask for a uh, user email id so it's it's like uh, complicated so this uh, uh, this persona like uh, in turn eliminates the registration and all stuff so again it's open and uh, whenever uh, you use this persona implementation for your websites you don't need to uh, whenever uh, there is a uh, patch submission or patch uh, the next version of uh, this system releases you don't need to take care of uh, again updating your source code or uh, single sign on system on your website so it turn takes uh, from the update and it just updates so this like uh, the freedom uh, give for, uh, we give for developers is like you can ch uh, change as you uh, ux as you want and in turn uh, it's like translated and available in like 48 languages and uh, so where uh, we actually uh, use in mozilla uh, the persona login so in uh, like everyone knows like mozillians.org is very uh, profile for uh, for every mozillian who is actively vol volunteering so in that we use uh, this sign a uh, single sign on per, uh, persona and even in firefox marketplace and even uh, bugzilla and even in open batches and batch pack so in the morning they were discussing about uh, webmaker so in that also in order to log in uh, you can just log in via persona uh, where it uh, ask you the credential i'll just show the show you the demo afterwards and there are other sites uh, which uh, uses persona as a login system is like woost uh, which is uh, event uh, management system and this is ting might be uh, like people may be knowing uh, this uh, site uh, uh, basically deals with uh, the amount of data used the amount of messages and all and discussion form like these are few websites uh, which act actually have implemented this persona and it was like very success so and uh, uh, even if you are it's not like uh, if if your website is like html or some uh, html you can uh, use a persona if it is like implemented on php you can uh, use this and it has like lot of libraries and plugins as i, I showed you and uh, let me tell you like uh, this persona is uh, basically working on a browser id protocol so uh, let me even tell you like how uh, that browser id protocol works uh, mainly this protocol has three actors uh, users relying parties and identity providers uh, users are quite like common who used to log in the web and uh, relying parties uh, where uh, uh, like let's uh, uh, take as example as webmaker a uh, webmaker dot uh, org is like relying party and identity provider is something like uh, which we use as a login like if you at all you use yahoo uh, at the rate sorry something at the rate yahoo.com as a login so that would be like identity provide so like how the how the this work i'll just uh, tell in uh, like three steps like uh, this is how uh, when you uh, click on sign in uh, it takes your email and as an input and uh, browser id is password like i mean to say a persona's password for the first time and then it uh, generates a key value pair stores its uh, private key in the uh, pc and send its public key to uh, identity authority and then they sign uh, with the public key and the email id and they'll uh, have they'll issue with validity interval like uh, certif certificate and then uh, it's it sends that certificate again back to a user and after it received by the user uh, it uh, it has to prove the ownership so again the uh, user's browser writes some kind of assertion in which uh, its email id and key and other details are present and that assertion is again sent to relaying party uh, like with the, with user certificate and then it's validated uh, so uh, uh, this is something like 
overview like where your uh, user rate you log in and from identity provi provider it is like validated and then you can just log into the website uh, i'll just show you a demo of that so like in the morning they were saying that we want to like log in into webmaker site then we have to use like login persona it's like So I say I have already used many times login. If someone could uh, come and try, they want to login into this site, then we can. So it's it's not asking me any password or anything. I'm just yeah I'm logged in. So it's like very easy. Uh, someone wants to try. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Uh, like if it is Firefox browser, then uh, with the option called Firefox Sync, uh, if suppose you are uh, lo you have logged in your desktop Firefox browser, so and you have the same uh, sync. Uh, key in your Android phone, then uh, it's you can directly log in. So I think it's clear. So he uh, in this we have sync now. So this is the option I was telling about. I think I'll use my other email ID rather than this. Uh, just remove this or else, yeah. So it's now verifying uh, with uh, Gmail because I have entered at the right Gmail. Oh, I'm already. Might be if someone wants to can try. Are there restrictions on the email address? Uh, as of mm -hmm. I knew, it's at Yahoo, Gmail, uh, Hotmail. It's working fine. Okay. Any, any email address should break. It just goes to the full bag. Yeah. I forgot the, the Unicode number, it doesn't matter. <laughs> because I have a uh, domain with a Unicode character, and it's a Google Apps domain, but I, I, I just don't have it here. <laughs> Let's try this. <coughs> yeah, mine, it is asking for me. It's currently low. <laughs> uh, this, this one second, one second. Looks suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> so now I can try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for the first time, <laughs> it need to value. Yay! Phone call, phone call. It only <laughs> Wow, there we go. Oh, that's a good start. <laughs> okay. What do I do now? You have logged into the website, so you can <laughs>
say, yeah. oh, we need one extra piece of information. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah, successfully logged in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it, it will show him. I'll just uh, try to log in mine or his. I have to remove your name. <laughs> Verify. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm done. Yeah. Like, I do not understand. Okay, that means to say, like, Uh, it's I I think I can answer this question. You can go to login.persona.org and you can there clear, clear all the persona logins so that it will not log you in anymore. So you can I think can I do it from another computer? Not yet. They're still thinking about that. When you run your personal identity provider, then you could take down your identity provider to do something like it, and that would probably work. So for example, I have my own IDP and if I would want to revoke any certificates that are out there for me, then I could take down my IDP to prevent people from logging in with those certificates signed with my earlier private key. Yes, the question, I will repeat the question for you. The question was that you said that since identity providers are bound to the domain for the email address and we just showed login in with Gmail, the question is if, pers if Google supports Persona and the answer is it does not directly, but the Persona team has built a couple of bridges that allow using the Google OAuth uh, API to uh, act as an identity provider. So you're really logging into gmail.login.persona.org and it uses the Gmail APIs to reuse uh, their credentials. And that works for Yahoo, Yahoo and Gmail today. Yes. Does this work with Internet Explorer? Yes. How? Hi. Do you want to answer the question? No, I think he has already said. So yes, it does work, and it's because it's all JavaScript mostly. Thank you. Thanks all. He has a big, a big applause for him because he has done a lot of kilometers to come here.
So really, it, it deserves. So, now we are welcoming another celebrity of Mozilla, uh, a great, great member of the Mozilla community, William, but he's most known as Fuzzy Fox. Um, so Fuzzy Fox works at the Mozilla Foundation on WebMaker. Um, a part of his job is dealing with designing for participation and web literacy. So he's going to talk to you about that. Um, he is also a Mozilla community volunteer from the United Kingdom. Um, and tonight, tonight, you may find William in a karaoke <laughs> because it's another of his specialties. And believe in me, he has just a fantastic voice. So please welcome William. Okay, so apparently the, the clip-on mic not working. Never mind. So uh, I'm Will, as Clarissa mentioned, and I work for the foundation mostly around web literacy and web maker stuff. Um, so this is me. Uh, my IRC handle is Fuzzy Fox, but that's the weirdest looking fox I've ever seen in the world. So not sure where that comes from. Um, but anyway, let's go through this nice and quick. Because uh, there's a whole bunch of interactive things here. So you aren't all just going to be doing whatever you want at your computer screens the whole time. I'm going to force you to engage with other people. I'm going to force you here to actually go and make a connection with someone, whether you like it or not. So just a heads up, those of you who have got laptops out, in about two, three minutes, you're going to want to have those things off the desks for their safety. So, as I mentioned, I work for these guys. You probably know them because of this thing, but I work on this thing. 
So Mozilla is built on four pillars of activity, which are, when the slide finishes moving, build, empower, teach, and shape. Now, fine, that's Mozilla's pillars of activity. What has this got to do with participation? Well, Mozilla exists because of participation. And through all of the papers that I've been reading over the past few months before doing this talk, you can start to spot these things recurring everywhere. And these don't just occur within Mozilla. These kinds of activities also appear within the Ubuntu community, within Linux, within almost every open source community in the world. So why are they so important? Um, and what is this participation thing that I keep mentioning? Because participation is a word that some people don't grasp straight away. You may think you're participating with people, and you may think you are making it easy for people to participate, but you might not. So Henry Jenkins, who is a professor at, UC, at USC, said this in the middle of one of the papers, and it just kind of stood out to me. Participatory, blah, 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 language fail. Participatory culture shifts the focus of literacy from one, individu one of individual expression to community involvement. So participatory culture is embedded in the roots of open source culture. You can't have one without the other. So let's, let's do a quick demonstration of that. Open source culture works because we try and make it easy for other people to reproduce things and do their own thing with the same code base. So let's do a physical demonstration, okay? I'm gonna have to let the mic go, so I'm gonna shout at you. So my apologies for shouting at you. I don't want to be mean, but technology, So what I want you to do is I want you to follow along. And I'm going to try and force you to get this wrong. OK? So arms out, thumbs down. Cross one arm over the other. Open your fingers. And grab, make your fist. OK, wiggle your thumbs, wiggle your little fingers. Thumbs, little fingers. In the back, little fingers. Thumbs, little fingers. Thumbs. And then all you have to do, little fingers, Thumbs, little fingers, keep going, keep going. All you have to do is twist like that. <laughs> so that's an example of not designing for participation while designing for participation. I got you all to get involved, but you all got it wrong. Now why? Well, I didn't tell you exactly what I was doing. I showed you, but you weren't looking for it because I wasn't explicitly saying hey, there's this step that I'm not going to tell you about, but you have to do it. So I'm not going to tell you that step right now. I'll let you try and work it out, and if you want to know the answer later, come and find me. But what we're going to do this time is do another example, but this time it's designing for participation that goes well and it acts exactly as it's supposed to. Who's heard of Thumb War? A couple of people, you know, where you get your thumbs and you, you waggle them like this. And you have two people, you have one person and another person, and you try and keep their thumb down for five seconds, and the person whose thumb is on top wins. Now, there's a, there's a, there's a mass engaged version of this called, well, Massive Multiplayer Thumb War. <laughs> and this, this will invoke a number of emotions all at the same time, confusion, excitement, anger, uh, hopefully not violence, um, but <laughs> what we're going to do, we're going to try and have a go at this. So i like just a couple of people who are kind of at the edges down here. I'm going to pick on you guys because you're at the edge and you're close. If you can come up, and we're going to try and recreate that so you guys can see how the hands fit together. And then what I want you to do is I want you to reach out to as many different people that you can physically reach, even if you have to stretch across seats. And we're going to have a giant game. And the winners are going to be the people that win the thumb war with both hands. <laughs> so, oh yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to mention, we have two hands, so we can play two at the time. Uh, the other thing is it doesn't have to just be a unit of four, it can be a unit of as many people as you like, because we know these things called networks, right, and you have clusters in them, and, well, we've got a couple of groups here, so there's going to be a big one here, no doubt, there's probably going to be a big one up towards the back there, and there's going to be a couple of kind of people like that. Stuck in the middle. But let's just try and get this hand gesture down. So in the photo, you can see all four hands revolving around each other. So stick your fingers out straight, always with the same hand. So everyone right-handed, and then close them up. 
okay? And then you get a thumb, thumb war. So the thumb war historically only starts when someone counts, di counts it in, okay? And that, let's, let's not have me do that, because I'm going to talk to you a lot otherwise, so. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> and that's cheating. And this can go on for a while. So before someone breaks something up here, laptops, put them somewhere safe. Don't just leave them on the table to get knocked off. But I now want you to turn to as many people as you can. You have two hands. Stretch out and have a go. This time, I have told you every possible step. So if you lose, it's just because you're bad. I want to see a connection from this group at the front all the way up to the back. You aren't getting away with it because you're all the way back there. No one start yet. It hasn't had the countdown. I've seen nodes of up to 10 hands together. Terrifying but possible. If there's an end that doesn't connect to anything, just waggle it around furiously, but you won't win with it. <laughs> okay, everyone ready? I'm gonna give you a minute, okay? You have one minute to beat everyone else in your thumb war. And remember, you've got two hands, so try and focus on both at the same time. It might help. Okay, on the count of three, two, one, Thumb war! As soon as you win, the hand you win with, shove it in the air. And that spare hand doesn't count still. Oh! <laughs> If you've won with a hand, if you win with your right hand, stick your right hand in the air. If you win with your left hand, stick your left hand in the air. If you win with both, do the awkward giraffe. And time's up. If you won with your right hand, put your right hand in the air. If you've won with your left hand, stick your left hand in the air. If you won with both, do the awkward giraffe. Woo! Okay, so here we've actually learned a couple of things at the same time. I haven't explained it to you guys explicitly, which is wrong, but I'm going to do that now. We're all from kind of the techie scene, techie world here, whether we're coders or we just write about this stuff or we just like to make people look stupid like I do. What we've actually engaged in here is not only connecting with people one-to-one -one and starting to get a little bit of an idea about who they are, you can kind of tell if someone's going to cheat that they're not the sort of person you want to let play the game with you again. But we've also started to learn about networks. So we can use physical activities to explain digital things. So a network is, as we know, a node with another node and another node connected somehow. Now we did that using our bodies and arms. And that's just one piece of digital literacy. And digital literacies, there's a lot of them. There's not one single digital literacy. There's a whole bunch from hardware to electronics to coding to binary to you name it, it exists. Web literacy is just one of these digital literacies. And that's the other thing that I work on. And that's the other thing in the title of this talk. So what is web literacy? How do we do some kind of demonstration of that? Because the web is code, it runs in the browser. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. But I'm going to try and at the same time start to demonstrate a point that I'm going to make in a bit. So there's this group called Hyper Island. And they, do these, they have this entire Bible called the Energizer Bible. And Energizer is a bit of jargon. So let's explain that jargon. Because it, it could mean a number of things. It doesn't mean batteries 
or the Energizer Bunny. Like, they're not connected to this. But an Energizer is an energy booster, okay? So sitting in here all day, like that, reasonably low energy. Thumb War, doing the awkward giraffe, they use up energy, and they also raise your energy levels because you have to start using some. Your body goes, I might need more, and throws it into your system. So you can read. I'm not going to read that all to you. These slides will be online later, so you can look them up later if you want. But we're going to play the shouting game. So this room's been fairly quiet. We've made a bit of noise now. Let's make a lot of noise. And I won't shout into the microphone, I promise. But the way we're going to play this is the shouting game is very simple in principle. Everyone starts shouting as loud as they can for two minutes. That's it. That's the whole game. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hack on this. So something that, we, you've, <laughs> something that you've heard in a, several of the presentations before me, and you may hear in some of the presentations after, is this word remix. Remix is embedded within this... Blah, 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 blah. I can't do my own language today. <laughs> remix is embedded within participatory culture, right? It's taking an idea, making a change, and then running with it. So the change I'm making is I don't want to shout random things, because that's what the game requires, just anything, just noise. I want you to start listing as many web-related things as you can, as loud as you can, for two minutes. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Start listing properties if you've run out of ideas. Start listing like, things like closures. This particular program, if it's related to the web, shout it. So, who's, who, who's, who's got a big voice? Who, who thinks they're going to be heard over this noise? This guy. All right, I'll, I'll stand further away from him, then. So, on the count of three, I want you to as loud as you can, okay? I want them to hear us in K building. I want you to shout as many different things about CSS as you can. And I'm going to shorten this down to a minute again. So, it might help if you stand up. It might not. I'll leave it to you, but there is a little known fact, but it's scientifically proven that when you stand up, you get a bit more space for your diaphragm, you can make a louder noise. And loud noises are fun. So, on the count of three, start listing as many things as you can, as loud as you can. Three, two, one. All together. Is that all you've got? Keep going. <laughs> what do sausages have to do with the web? <laughs> okay, so that's enough shouting. I think we've definitely terrified anyone wanting to come into this room. So, well done. Um, we might have to go and say it's okay, it's okay, we're not going to kill you when you come in. Uh, I, I don't know, sausages guy might, but whatever. So how does this tie to web literacy? Well, you all said a lot of different things, and they're all to do with the web. And web literacy is the understanding of things on the web, or things how the web works, and so on and so forth. But trying to pick out the individual words you're saying at the same time as each other, while shouting it, while trying to get your one point across, is incredibly hard. I only heard sausages because he waited till the end. I only heard CSS because he waited till the end, and everyone else had shut up. But that's not how the web works. The web is continual content, continual voices going out and trying to get heard. And that's good. That's what it should be. But there needs to be a way for people that don't understand these things to map this out, to try and work out what's kind of key to knowing how the web works. And then from there, they can move on and start shouting themselves. We can start to make a louder noise. We can start to have a bigger impact. So. This is the web literacy map. I'm not going to go into detail. It's something that was created by Mozilla to try and map out what you need to know to be web literate. You've got columns, which are strands, and they relate to three things, exploring, building, and connecting. And within those, you've got things like navigation, search, privacy. I don't know if you can see that on this screen. I can't. Uh, so go and look this up. But this 
is a good way to map things out that look like this. If we had all of you, everything you said, in a big list, we'd end up with something like that. And this is just Bugzilla. I chose this because a lot of you are coders, a lot of you have seen a tool like this. I'm trying to engage. Maybe not well, but I'm trying. And this, this is hard. Um, for someone who's brand new, trying to get involved with something like this, it's kind of terrifying. You've got these things here that mean something, and email addresses, lots of them. And what, what, what's going on here? What's a SOP? Uh, yeah. There are better ways to do it for the new people, right? Us coders, we love this stuff. This is fine for us. For someone trying to get into this area, for someone trying to become web literate, or just digitally, blah, blah, digitally literate, or just get involved, terrifying. You're going to hate me in a second. There we go. So Josh Matthews created this wonderful tool, which kind of digests it down a bit. Well, I say a bit, a lot. But it does it in a good way. It's really simple. The call to action is really clear. Like, What's your favorite programming language? We can all answer that question. New people, maybe not as much, but if they've had a little bit, bit of coding experience, they probably have a bit of an opinion there. We're all very good at having opinions. And then it says, tell me more, boring. Well, I clicked tell me more, because I know a bit of JavaScript, I kind of like it. So I get to see, oh look, there's this, this thing that I can get involved with. And from here, I can go and explore that more. I can say, nah, I don't like that. Or I can say, oh, I don't like JavaScript anymore. What the hell is that? It's terrifying. Look at it. It's ugly. It's like you. He's completely oblivious. It's OK. I do know him. <laughs> so this is a graph you'll see a lot when it comes to contribution. You've got this is, is time contributed. So a lot of you guys are probably in this area. So you know how to talk to these people. These guys can look after themselves. You don't have to try and engage with these people as, with as much gusto. You don't have to try and dumb things down, which you don't have to do for anyone, but I'll get onto that. But these guys, they know Bugzilla, or they know GitHub issues. They like looking at it because they understand how it works. These guys are literate. Then you've got the people who are slightly less literate. And we, we, we're kind of good at dealing with those people. We're, we're kind of OK. And when a new coder comes up, you might have a bit of a, this question again? Well, th th at least you answer the questions. We're, we're OK. Then, then there's this entire orange section down the bottom. We're very bad at helping these people. Like, everyone is very bad at this. Even if you try to do it, you're very bad at it. But this, this curve is not a problem. This is what you should see. The problem is if this is really steep. If this is a really steep curve and you only have a couple of people who are literate, the guys down this end are never going to have a freaking clue what you're talking about. They aren't going to know what you mean when you start talking about C compilers. They're just going to look at you and go, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Uh, but, eh. So what you want to do is try and get a shallower curve. And a shallower curve is fairly easy to achieve. It doesn't mean dumbing things down. It means removing jargon, right? I had the Energizer slide up, and it had a, word, a piece of jargon in there, which you now know. You now know what Energizer means. Because I put an explanation. I explained what that piece of jargon meant. This is simply a good way to go, hey, we do a lot of things. What are you interested in? So you ask the question. You try and work out stuff to work out where you can best put them in terms of this is an area of the community you may be interested in getting involved in. That starts to shallow that curve out because you start to go onto their playing field. They start, you start to move people from the bottom end of that curve into the middle. And once they're in the middle, it's easier to move them up to the end and the curve starts to shallow itself out automatically. You don't have to do much work to make that happen. 30 seconds is enough. I mean, how long does it take to write a new thing for this, like a new question? 30 seconds. See? So this is good. This is also good. This is good for people at the end. This is good for people at the top. And 
we don't need to be afraid of the people at the end. What we need to be is considerate and understanding that they don't understand all of the technical terms we're using all the time. They might have a good grasp of basic web development, for example. Like, they have an okay grasp of making a web page. It looks kind of okay, and it does something useful. But when you start throwing terms at them that they've never heard before, that's not going to help. That's going to push them back out to the other end. What you want to do is, when you throw one of those terms at them, if you get a look back, then you need to start explaining things. Okay? And you don't have to dumb it down. Just start going, well, this one word could be explained by five words without losing any meaning or context. Use the five words. So there's a brilliant African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That doesn't mean that your project has to go slow. We've already solved for that with open source. We have this thing. It's called Git. It's wonderful. Version control in general. It allows people to take the bits that they want to work on, do it quickly at their own pace, and then send it back. But the people that are doing the slower stuff, they can go at a slower pace without having any real impact on their learning or their understanding. So Mark Zerman, who is the executive director of Mozilla Foundation, uh, said this. And it's a quote that I've used in numerous different presentations, but it has a, a resonating piece in it, which is that the power of the web is the idea anyone can make. So anyone, anyone, including the people at the bottom of the graph down there, they can make anything for the web. Right? We all need to be web makers. And that doesn't just mean we all need to make things for the web. It means we need to help other people make things for the web as well. And this applies to things like C compilers. This applies to everything. I'm just sticking with the lit web literacy stuff because that's what I know. And hopefully you now know a little bit more about that, as well as a little bit more about how to design for participation. So I'm going to have like one more slide for you. And it's equation. And I did steal this slide. But I, I, I mentioned who it was at the bottom. And there's a link so you can go and watch the entire talk. It's on TED. It's really, it's really worth the watch. Especially if you like women saying, talk nerdy to me. That, that's in there a lot. But it's, it's pretty simple. Take your science, which is your code and whatever. Remove bullet points and jargon, because looking at bullet points on slides and on web pages, unless they're short and concise, horrible. Divide by relevance, and that means only give the information that's useful. Okay, So remove anything that isn't relevant. Times it by your passion. You're sat in a room in the middle of Brussels, coming from goodness knows how far away, because you're passionate about your project. Represent that in your explanations. And that will equal better understanding. And better understanding means better participation. And that means moving people from the bottom of the curve towards the top of the curve and shallowing it out. So questions? I've got five minutes max. Yes. Someone get a microphone to him before he starts asking me things and no one else can hear. Because that wouldn't be good for participation. That's a hard word to say sometimes. In the, uh, in the slide we just saw, where did you divide by relevance? I divide by relevance. I, I divide by relevance because that's what's in the original slide. I think a better thing to have in there would be divide by non-relevance. So get rid of the stuff that isn't relevant to the conversation. So if you're trying to talk about a closure, for example, in JavaScript, don't start going on and how you can use these things like for the really crazy stuff on the cutting edge before you've explained what it actually does. Do the explaining first. Do the relevant stuff first. You can get onto the other stuff later. It can wait. Any others? No? OK, I'm going to be floating around in here for at least another two talks. So you can come find me. Oh, yeah. Uh, can we get a microphone down here? Run, Ziggy, run! Wrong way around. So you've got the number of contributors here. So this is like thousands and millions of people. And then you've got the amount of time they're contributing. The people that are contributing a lot of time, 
will typically, and there are caveats, but we'll typically have a good understanding already. Because if you don't have an understanding of something, you've still got to be a very determined person to keep trying to do that. And the, the general rule is people aren't, don't have that patience. Anyone else? No? Okay. So, if I run through these as quickly as I can, there is a slide at the back for you. Oh, come on, move quicker. So, you can get in touch with me at the email address at the bottom. Uh, yeah, and I'm out here. You have two minutes to sing us a song if you want. <laughs>